Amen. And he is great. It's good to see you today. National Back to Church Sunday. Amen. How many of y'all have somebody as a guest with you today? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Good. Give these people a praise the Lord. Hope you got properly welcomed at our welcome time when everybody came around and looked down on you <laughs> while you were seated. We're not looking down. We're looking up with you. But praise the Lord. It is National Back to Church Sunday. Great service over at other camps. Well, we had a house full. The Lord was there. It was a great, great time. I know that Pastor Strickland got up and mentioned the recipients of our Faithful Servant Awards that we give out every year. And uh, for those of you members and been around here for a while, you know what an honor that, that re to receive that Linda Nettles Faithful Servant Award is. Uh, you know the origins of the Faithful Servant Award, uh, named after Brother Linda Nellis, who's such a faithful brother in Christ and probably trained more soul winners here than any other person's ever done. Probably won more souls to Jesus. He's gone on to be with the Lord and left us with the mess. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we're handling it. Hopefully it won't be long. We'll all be there with him. Amen. But there is one more of these awards that I did want to give out today. Every year we give these awards out to people that uh, are serving the Lord so faithfully. And there's one guy here that's probably deserved it ever since it first came out that we have never awarded it to. And for a good reason. We just didn't want it to go to his head. <laughs> Not seriously. Bear with me. But I'd like to bring him up at this time, and maybe you'll realize why we didn't award it to him early, because he was on our, as a full-time staff member before. But Tim Ellis, why don't you come up here right now? <laughs> Lyndon Ellis is Tim's dad, by the way. And uh, between you and me, brother, is not only a, my brother in Christ, my friend in the Lord, I believe you know what this all stands for and what this all means. Amen? <laughs> Love you. Appreciate you, brother. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for bringing that up, gentlemen. Appreciate that very much. I'll find my little uh, remote control here in just one second here. You know, today I want to talk to you a little bit more what we started last week in talking about the church, the role of the church, the ministry of the church, and the ministry specifically of Believer's Fellowship Church and what the Lord is doing here. As I shared a while ago, we had our leadership banquet where we hand those awards out. In our leadership banquet, we try to reiterate our vision and go over our passion and try to encourage those who faithfully serve the Lord. We had about 100 people at that meeting the other night, and it was a great time of ministry and fellowship. I've been pastoring here. Next year will be 25 years at Believer's Fellowship. Been here a while, but I've lived... Thank you. I've lived a lot longer time in this area than just that 25 years of ministry. I was an evangelist for 16 years. We based our headquarters out of this Magnolia Spring area for all those years. And so i uh, been around this area a long, long time, like older than dirt, you know. But I found out in that time that churches assume kind of a, a, an identity, you know, that if someone tells you they go to a certain church and they say, well, I go to this church, and you, you say, well, that means this. Or if I go to that church, it means this. You know, if I were to say to you I went to a particular church in the community from here to the woodlands, you'd, you'd kind of, if you've been around a while and a believer long, ago, uh, long enough, you would kind of say, well, I know what kind of church that is, or I know what they preach or what they don't preach. Uh, so I know what they're talking about. But I reiterated at that, at that uh, leadership dinner that when you tell anybody that you go to Believer's Fellowship, it ought to mean something. And if your life doesn't really match up to what God's doing and telling us our lives ought to be, then please tell them you go to church somewhere else. <laughs> Amen. And I just said a few things. I said, you know, if you tell people you're a member of Believer's Fellowship, it means, one, it ought to have a testament in the community that we love the Lord. We love God at Believer's Fellowship. We love God. We love people. We're interested in what God's doing in the world today and touching people's lives and changing people. It means I believe the Word of God. If you kind of believers fellowship, we preach the Word of God. We believe the Bible. I, I think it really means if I go to believers fellowship, then I really aspire to go deeper with God. I don't want to be nominal. I don't want to be mediocre. I want to go to a church where they, uh, where they, they, in, they encourage me, where they, where they hold me accountable, where they, where they help me in my walk with God. I think if you tell people, I go to Believer's Fellowship, it should say, I'm not interested in just sitting and attending. I want to serve God. I want to discover God's mission for my life. I, 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 I want to serve the Lord. Bottom line is, I think if you tell people, you go to Believer's Fellowship, they whisper something to their friend like this, oh, they're radical. <laughs> they're radical. Because I believe that discipleship is radical. 
I believe if you really are a follower of Jesus, your life is noticeably different from the rest of the world. But that's the way it ought to be. I love this church. I love what God's been doing in this church over the years and how he has shaped it. And I look forward to what God's going to do in the days that are ahead of us. But if you really want to know what we are pursuing, we're pursuing the New Testament model of being a church. You say, well, how are you trying to, what's your philosophy of ministry? What are you trying to do as a church? What, are you community driven? Whatever. Hey, we want to be the model. We want to be like that model that's given to us in the New Testament. So that when we look in the Bible and we look at what Jesus was saying and what he was wanting and what the epistles teach us about church structure and leadership and, and discipleship, or we go to the book of Acts and we see the church in action as, as it's first being born, that's the kind of church we seek to model. That's what we want to follow after. That's the goal of our church. And I want to talk to you briefly this morning about that. You know how brief I can be. I just want to lay out six or seven, eight, ten, twelve, a hundred things, maybe. No, we'll see. Of just what this church is all about. And I'd like to rehearse something. And I've preached over this over the years a few times as we've gone through this particular book, the Bible, in Acts, where we've talked about the, the model of the New Testament church. And I'm looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. And it says, And with many words he solemnly testified, it, testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Next verse says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place amongst them through the apostles. I'm clicking, it's not happening here. Work with me, I'm hitting the wrong button, all right? All those who had believed were together and all had all things in common and they began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have a need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. As we look at this today and you start looking at what the Bible says, understand that what you're reading here is the beginning, the birth of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus had in mind when he came and he brought the gospel message. And he knew that there was going to be a time where he would depart after the resurrection, but he would leave the presence of the Holy Spirit in a group of people who would be a living organism in the world to take and make a difference in the world and to reach people and to see lives change. And the way he chose to do that was through the church and the New Testament. You read all those epistles, so much of it tells us how the church functions. Who is in charge? Who works? Who serves? Who does what? How they do it and why they do it. It's all written out through scripture. But I want to give you today in this message, perhaps we have a lot of visitors here as well, and number one, to encourage those who are members and to edify, to strengthen, and exhort you and hopefully motivate you to, to keep going on for God. And those who are guests of ours today, you might get a little insight as to what our vision at Believer's Fellowship is. First of all, is to follow this model. The first thing was Believer's Fellowship is to be made up of people who are followers of Jesus Christ. Verse Chapter 2, verse 40 says, And with many words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them. What's he telling them? Get saved. Joe Arm's translation. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Get saved among this perverse generation. Believer's fellowship is first and foremost made up of people who do know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They have become followers of Jesus Christ. I think you know as well as I that there's a lot of people in churches today who don't fit that bill. They're not followers of Jesus Christ. They may be decent, moral, good citizens, good moms and dads perhaps, but they've never made a decision in their heart to really strike out and follow Jesus Christ, become a disciple. That's what really gets down to the heart of that little terminology about being born again. Somebody that's born again is somebody who's committed to Christ. They're following Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They don't just say, I'm going to heaven. They live it. They've committed their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. They're not just religious because religion is insufficient. They have a relationship that defines who they are. And that relationship is first and foremost with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's real to them. It's not artificial. It's not church talk. It's not just being Baptist or whatever it might be. Hey, it's, a real, it's the real deal. 
Believers Fellowship, if you want to be a member of this church, there's only one prerequisite. You must have given your life to Jesus Christ. You've given your life. Now, if you haven't been baptized, since you have done that, then we'll help you in that regard. But the first step, give your heart to Jesus Christ. That's what makes up a church. People who do know that they do know that they know that Christ is in their life and they are changed, born again, children of God. The second thing about this church is we seek to maintain what they did in Acts chapter 2, a devoted fellowship. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, continually devoting themselves to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You know as well as I, that devotion is not a word that's used often in our culture and our society anymore. There's not a lot of people devoted to anything anymore. Devotion is, a, is something that's somehow been lost in the works. And what brings to my mind the reality of this word is it's like the season that we have just been through with the Olympics. And I love the Olympics. But what you see in the Olympics are all these athletes who've made tremendous sacrifices because they have devoted themselves to something. They devoted themselves to winning the prize, to being the first, to being the best, all right? And that requires devotion. Michael Phelps, who won all those awards, whoever else came back with gold and silver and bronze, they did it because they were a, an extremely devoted person. But again, that, that's a word that's lost in the culture for the most part. Now, the Bible tells us that this first century church, they were devoted. They devoted themselves completely. It involved commitment. It involved sacrifice. We're living in a changing world. You don't have to, to see that. You, know, you don't have to look very far to see that. But the Bible tells us that we can be true and we can have a foundation and we can be settled and we don't have to change like the weather. That we can have substance to our life because we are devoted to God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That we can have a life of commitment and surrender. And the church is where that is first and foremost found in our daily walk in life. These folks were committed. What were they committed to? Well, it says they were committed to the, to the, to, to the apostles' teaching. They were committed to the fellowship. They were committed to the breaking of bread. They were committed to, uh, to prayer. That's some pretty tremendous statement being made there, by the way. Their devotion was, first of all, to the teaching. In other words, they didn't just hear what the Bible had to say from their leadership. They embraced it. In fact, you read about the Bereans in the New Testament. When the apostles went to the Bereans and they shared the gospel with them, they studied the Old Testament scriptures to make sure what they were hearing was the truth. And when they heard it was the truth, they said, that's for me, that's what we want. And they got rid of all the junk that was in their life and made a real decision to make a difference in the world around them. They believed what was being preached to them. And fortunately today, you've heard me say it before, today most congregations are, are like a jury more than they're like a congregation. They hear the sermon, they go out and deliberate on it. Well, do I believe that or not? Do I like that or not? It's not a matter of deliberation. What we do is we go and we study the Scripture. Does the Scripture say this is true? If it's true, then we receive it and we believe it. They were devoted. They devoted themselves to the teaching, but it also says to fellowship. Now, in the original language of the Greek in which this is written, it is a, it is a very clear, definitive terminology here. It's a definite article when it says fellowship. It literally would read in the English like this. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. They put it in simple terms. They came to church. They came to church. They got with other believers. They fellowshiped with other believers. They had relationships that were genuine and real and life transforming because they were devoted, devoted one to another. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. That's remembering the covenant or remembering the cross and remembering Christ and remembering his resurrection. And they were devoted to prayer. And I'll talk a little bit about that more in just a moment. But folks, devotion's a good thing. A thing that will change and transform your life. And most people aren't devoted to anything these days. Number three, Believer's Fellowship understands the importance of this New Testament model of small group ministry. When you follow these people through in Acts chapter 2 and then into 4, and eight, you see these people met not only in the, tab in the temple, in large groups where they would worship together and where the apostles would preach and teach, but then they would disperse into homes where they'd have further discipleship and meeting and eating and fellowshipping together in that regard. In fact, you see a twofold ministry that unfolds that the church has, and it's this small group set and this large group set. This was practiced in the very life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see him ministering to thousands of people, and then you see him going off with those 12 disciples, and there being that interchange and the teaching and explanation and ministry that would take place within that small group, and they ministered out of that group. It's that place where, where, where things happen, 
within the context of the mission of Jesus. I believe it's the same for the church today. And a lot of people don't understand our small group ministry here. We're like, like a lot of churches who have like Sunday school where you kind of come in and you have maybe 35 minutes or so and you read from a, a, a Bible study devotional. Like we called them quarterlies when I was growing up. And you, somebody reads from the quarterly and then somebody seeks to explain what the quarterly is saying and then we'd have a time of prayer and we'd get, get out of there before church starts. We wouldn't be late for church because we knew the pastor would come in and fuss at us if we didn't get ready for church. With our small group ministry that we have, we do it house to house. Now, some of them take place here at the church house, but the majority of them take place in homes. And that's that place of small group ministry. And there's several things that we attempt. One is we want to provide through that a tool of outreach. Now, lift is an acrostic, most of you understand, for living in fellowship together. That's what God's called us to do. And he's called us, if we follow this model of scripture, to do it in this kind of format, but also in smaller group formats. And it can be and should be and is a great and tremendous tool of outreach that we have. A lot of people, they're not going to come up to the church house, but they will come if you invite them to your home on a Sunday night and participate in those Bible studies. It's the place, we provide a place to receive encouragement, love, support, prayer within the group. It's that place. It's the place that provides that arena where you can get to know people. And not just to know them, you can really form lasting relationships. Uh, you and I both know that's not what a lot of people in the world are interested in anymore. We don't want relationships. We want isolation. We withdraw ourselves. We don't want to kind of be transparent with anybody. We're afraid somebody might see our warts or something, you know. And we just kind of withdraw and, and do our own thing. That wouldn't follow the model of Jesus. And that doesn't follow the model of the New Testament. There's a relationship. The Bible says that we are the family, the family of God. And there's this place in, in lift that, that God does these incredible things of, of developing these relationships that God is honored in. It provides a place first and foremost, and I believe this is the bottom line, along with the outreach issue, is it provides a place for discipleship true spiritual growth through study of the Word of God. Our studies that we do within our lift groups, within our living and fellowship together groups, they are studies that are very geared to your life, your spiritual growth, enhancing your spiritual walk in life, helping you where you are in your life, and bringing you those truths and in an atmosphere where you can embrace them and also receive deeper help and instruction if you need it. It's a great ministry that God's given us through that. Go ahead and click that one more time because I hit, hit the wrong button again. I'm getting used to it, all right? They gave me a new clicker two weeks ago, all right? Lift provides a place to minister to the needs of others. So not only are you going and getting something, you're not just sitting there, you're getting something. You don't, we don't have that opportunity on Sunday morning. This is, a, this is a general assembly of corporate worship where we come together and we get a general instruction. I want you to know, friends, as much as I love you, you're not going to really be discipled to the deeper core that God wants you walking with just coming on Sunday mornings. There's just too many needs here. There's a few hundred people. You can't, as one person can't minister to all those needs. That's why Jesus had this smaller group for developing growth and discipleship and letting the disciples learn how to use what God had given them. And God is sending them out to minister even from the small group. But it's where you can use your spiritual gifts in ministering to other people. It provides that place of personal ministry and even more importantly, that personal prayer. It's the place where we grow. Our goal at Believer's Fellowship, you know, we have that, that tremendous statement that we make that, you know, we're all about bringing members into the body of Christ, salvation of Jesus Christ, helping people, you know, to, to find their ministry in the church and their, their mission in the world so they might magnify God. But let me give you our church statement in, in a simple term. It's all about discipleship. Discipleship. Say that with me. One more time. Discipleship is learned as well as, you know, received by having people around you that are disciples, that are encouragers, that are people who will exhort you and strengthen you. And I, I really believe that you know, even though we have a good quality number of our people, according to the percentage of church that go to lift groups, there's a lot more of you that are missing out on this vital ministry in your life who just need to take the time to go experience it. Just to take the opportunity to say, hey, you know, I, or I used to do that. You need to be involved with other people. Relationships. You can't get through the scriptures. The Bible says, as I said, we are a family. And the Bible tells us how we relate to one another. The Bible says you treat the, the older like fathers, the women like your mothers, the, the younger men like your brothers, the, the women like your sisters, the younger women like your sisters. So he tells us, so how do we function? How would your family function if you never lived in the same house? 
if you never spent time together? Well, it'd be a dysfunctional. Like one person said, we put the fun in dysfunctional. But nonetheless, it would be dysfunctional. There's such a tremendous ministry available to you if you really want to be a disciple, if you really want to go deeper, and if you want to develop some relationships that God would have you develop that will bring an accountability as well as an encouragement to your life. Let me read you a quote from John Ortberg, Brother Tim gave me. He says, researchers found that the most isolated people, now listen carefully, people who isolated themselves, instead of developing relationships, they were three times more likely to die sooner than those with strong relational connections. Now that's not some percentages I'm interested in going with, amen? I don't wanna die three times sooner than everybody else. He said people who had relationships and got involved with relationships live longer. He said that even people who had bad health habits, smoking, bad eating habits, obesity and alcohol, but they had strong ties, because they had strong relationship ties, they lived longer than people who had great health habits, but lived isolated lives. I think that boils down to this. In other words, you can go to Lyft and eat Twinkies with good friends. It's better than being alone eating broccoli. <laughs> Amen. You've got to have community in the church. You should be providing an authentic community whereby our lives can be meaningful in other people's lives as well. Don't live like an island. There's benefit and wisdom what God's saying to us. And this is God's way of multiplying the church. You see this model all through the New Testament. Paul would talk to some of the ministries that were happening in homes over and over again through the letters he gave us. We seek to model our church after that New Testament model. You say, well, I don't understand it. That's the way God's given us to do it. That's the model that we follow. It's a New Testament model. Fourth, Believer's Fellowship seeks to magnify God as sovereign. In Acts chapter 4, the, the persecution begins. Things get bad. People begin to be drugged out of their homes. They begin to die for the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tremendous persecution comes to the church in Jerusalem. And the Bible says they were scattered all around. Now, when the first of the persecution starts in Acts chapter 4, you see them gathering and praying this prayer. When they heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer and said, Sovereign Lord, you made heaven and earth, the sea, everything in it. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. Why did the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers are against the Lord and against the anointed one. What are they saying here? They're saying, God, we're in trouble. The leaders, the kings, the president, everybody's against us. We're suffering persecution, but we're glad that you're bigger than the president. We're glad that you're bigger than the kings. We're glad that you're bigger than the Sanhedrin. You're God, you're sovereign. One thing we do at Believers Fellowship continually, weekly, through our cell group ministry, through our church-wide, is we always want to be magnifying the sovereignty of God, that he is over all things. We are living in desperate days. It was interesting to see a statistic that I shared with you last week about people who go to church regularly, how they're happier people. And statistics show this. They're not despondent. They're not living in depression. They're not always in despair. Why? Because they understand hope and they're around people filled with hope and they're studying a book that's all about hope and their lives have been changed by the hope of glory himself who lives in them. Christ changes our lives. So I don't have to live in abject fear our despair. Oh, the world's so bad, it treats me so... Well, God never said it would treat you good to start with, amen. But the idea is here, we continue to exalt God over all things. So if I'm having difficulty, I don't have to go to my doctor and say, Doc, I just don't feel good. I just not, I'm not happy. I'm just not happy. And doc says, uh, let me prescribe you something. And he gives you a little 30-day supply of happy pills. Uh, that's our gospel, amen? <laughs> amen. We, don't, we don't have to go to the doctor to get the bottle of happy pills when we understand the sovereignty of God. Now, I know that cuts against the grain, even some Christian psychiatrists and psychologists, but folks, I want you to know when you discover Christ and the joy of the Lord, there seems to be significance to your life now that you're not letting the world impress and depress you. You're making an impression on the world around you. Amen. Amen. So there's, it's a lot cheaper to love Jesus, amen? What are they saying? I mean, they're getting a vision of the greatness of God and they're exalting God as Lord over all. You know, the Lord's the one who said, you know, that I, you know, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. What does that mean? That means we want to be a part of a church 
is not letting the world destroy us, affect us, infect us. We want to be the overcomers in the culture we live in. So that's why we seek to model the, the model of the New Testament church. When it says the gates of hell won't prevail against us, remember that the gates of hell are stationary. They're not coming against us. We're going against them. And we want to be a church that's not afraid to storm the gates of hell. We're not afraid of getting a little dirt on us so we get around sinners. We love sinners. Amen. We want to get so close to the gates of hell, we can smell the smoke. We're not afraid to tell people about Jesus. We're not afraid to reach out and help people. We're not afraid to reach out and encourage people. We're not afraid to tell the world Jesus saves. It's our goal. It's our responsibility. And that's the kind of church God would have us be a part of. That's when we realize that God is sovereign. We don't have to worry about the devil. God's over all things. Fifth thing about Believer's Fellowship, we seek to maximize the power of prayer. These people are praying. In fact, 48 times in the book of Acts, it says they prayed, they prayed, they prayed. Every time a problem came, what did they do? They prayed. Somebody's thrown in jail, we prayed. Somebody's giving us a difficult time, they prayed. Now, I think when we do maximize the sovereignty of God, that does the automatic thing, which brings us to the place of, we need to pray. We need to trust God. How many of you going through a crisis? Don't raise your hand. We'd all be raising our hands. <laughs> Just, I mean, there's something going on and it looks bad and it's difficult. Here's your solution. You pray and you're not praying in vain. You're not praying to a, a ceiling. God is present. The Bible says he's near, which means right here. God is, a, God is present. We can, we can trust that he's hearing us. We just need to have our hearts and our ears and our minds clean and clear so we can hear back and believe God. We pray. How often do we need to realize that, hey, yes, things are difficult to be, but we do pray and we believe God. In fact, when the persecution got worse and worse, the Bible says in Acts 4, after they prayed, the place they were standing in began to be shaken. That's the kind of prayer meeting we needed, amen? That it literally shakes us, that it moves us, that God's glorified by it all, and he's honored by the fact that we are looking to him, not to the world, not to solutions, not to people, not to money. I mean, I hear too many pastors say that. If we had bigger buildings, bigger crowds, more people, then we could do, no. We have everything we need to do everything God called us to do if we'll but pray and seek his face because he's bigger than all things. Somebody else say amen louder than that. We magnify God and we seek to enforce and maximize the power of prayer in our midst. Number six, we seek to model Christ-like generosity. All the believers are of one heart and mind. And they were so much of one heart and mind, the scripture says, if you had a need, they reached out to your need. In fact, if I couldn't meet your need, I was so burdened that I'd go do what I need to do to help you meet your need. Now, I know we're living in a culture and part of the whole thing about the, the election this year is going on, about this whole mindset that, that America now has of the idea that government owes me something and, you know, the government's supposed to take care of me and the government, you know, is, handles all the welfare. But, you know, that, that's not in the Bible. You know, you don't see that. Nothing in Scripture that says the government should provide for the welfare of the people. There's nothing that I find. But there is a lot in Scripture that says the church should be a welfare agency to the body of Christ and to the world around them. Now, the difference between the church doing it and the government doing it is, with the church, God gives us guidelines for that. With the church, God gives us accountability for that. With the church, God gives us responsibility. He shows us how to, how to give, who to give. He says, first of all, to that, the household of faith, but then, then to the rest of the world as well. Do we have responsibilities to help people that are in genuine need? Genuine need. See, the problem with the government, they don't know how to define genuine need. So we have everybody mulching off and living off and sapping off, you know, this, 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 these entitlement programs. And about the time you say you want to vote something where that's changed, man, everybody goes crazy because that's where the free stuff comes from. First Thessalonians lays it out very clearly. It says if a person isn't willing to work, they shouldn't eat. Uh-oh. It doesn't say if they can't work, you know. It basically says if there's no willingness to work. And we have a lot of people who just won't, aren't willing to work. I, I was amazed to hear the other day, the 23-something million people that are unemployed, and how many of this even quit looking. I mean, why not quit looking? They're going to keep extending your benefits. I mean, they keep, well, I mean, my unemployment's running. All right, give them a couple months. They'll, they'll extend it another, another year, and another year, and another year. And now we've gotten so deep in debt, we don't be able to help anybody that really does have a need. Are you willing to work? I, I, you know as well as I do, we live in a culture today where there's a lot of lazy people. I, I can go stand in unemployment lines today when people could be working and they're not because they don't take a job beneath them or beyond them or have to retrain for something. There's a lot of people who are willing to work. Those people we need to be helping and the people that we need to be working, reaching out to. 
You say, well, you know, when I read this at time to time, it says they sold lands and houses and sold them, brought the money to the church. They sold them, put it at the apostles' feet and said to strip to anybody who has a need. That sounds like communism to me. No, it's not communism at all. Communism says, what's yours is mine. And I'm going to take it. We're going to redistribute the wealth. But when you look at Scripture and what Christianity says, Christianity says, what's mine belongs to God. And I'll do with it whatever God wants me to do with it. If God wants me to give it, then I'll give it because it all belongs to him. It's like one man said, you know, there's only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will have. That's what Christianity finds. Charitable, generosity. And our church is a generous church. We help a lot of people. Everything from helping them in, in economic ways to helping them find jobs, to helping them with their careers and resumes and job contacts and information to food pantries to benevolence funds. There's a lot of way we help. But we don't want that help to go on and on and on and on. You need to get busy. You need to find a job. You need to get to work after a certain period of time. No matter if it's something you don't necessarily like. Can I get a witness? But the church becomes that center place where we invest our time, our talents, our treasures, and we invest them for a reason that will bring glory and honor to God and make a difference in people's lives. We're investing for eternity where Jesus said, don't lay up yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust is corrupt, but lay up yourself treasures in heaven. What's that mean? That means you live as a steward. You realize that everything I got really belongs to the Lord. And praise the Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll distribute it as he leads me and as I have the Spirit's unction and I'm going to make myself. We as a church want to be a generous church. We want to model the love and the character and the generosity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this church did in the New Testament. That's the kind of church that we want to be. You know, my life's not going to last much longer. Don't look at me like that. Some of you won't last that long. There's probably a few of you in here that I'm going to do your funeral before they do mine. <laughs> Amen. And if that it goes the other way, hey, that's graduation day for me. I'm not worried about it. That's a praise the Lord. But don't you want to know when you stand before God one day, that your life meant something more than just acquiring for yourself, that it meant something in the long run of eternity, that lives were changed as a result of your life. And that's expressed in so many ways. It's expressed in so many different avenues, in so many different ways. That's what I love about our small group ministry in reality. I'm the last guy to hear most of the time, as the pastor, the last guy to hear about somebody being in the hospital. Because by the time I hear about it, they've gotten to the hospital and some small group folks have been over there, have taken care of them, ministered to them, prayed with them, taken care of their kids, gotten food on their family table at the house. All this stuff's going on long before I ever hear about it. That's a great church. That's the kind of church this was. They weren't waiting on an elected board to handle everything. They weren't waiting on a, an elected pastoral official to be the official dignitary who handles all that. No, these people were involved in other people's lives. And they modeled it with their life. Number seven, we're just about done, so hold on. Believer's Fellowship seeks to mobilize every minister, every person for ministry. If you come to Believer's Fellowship, we want you to be involved in other people's lives. We want you to make a difference touch in other people's lives. Everybody has a spiritual gift if you're saved. In Acts 6, it says, the day, In those days, the numbers of disciples were increasing, and the Grecian Jews among the, them complained against those who... Uh, who, who, who the, of the Arabic-speaking community because what they, were, they felt like they were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. You know what followed? The ministry broke out. God started the deacon ministry, all right? Verse 7, so the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. What happens? We have a problem in the church all of a sudden. One of the first ones mentioned, all right? Somebody didn't feel like they were getting their attention. You know, he didn't shake my hand. And so out of that problem, another ministry develops called a deacon ministry. And those deacons began to handle those service roles and ministries in that project to make everything, sure that everything was done accordingly. But that's the way it should be. Every time there's need, every time there's a situation, every time even a complication arises, there's this kind of inward built ministry that takes place of this inward healing process where people start functioning in the gifts and the callings God's given and the things are taken care of. That's why when we even began the church in, in different ministries, people said, when are we going to start this ministry? I said, as soon as God raised up someone with a burden. Because you can only do so many things. And I can only do so many things. Even a paid staff can only do so many things. And so the church has this tremendous opportunity to stretch out, reach out, and be what God's called to be, and discover what God's called them to do in their ministries. You have a gift. You have a gift. And God gave you that gift for a reason. And it wasn't just so you could have a gift. So you could say, I've got a gift. Or you could take a spiritual gifts exam and say, I discovered my gift. 
He gave you the gift so you administer that gift to the rest of the body of Christ. The eighth thing is important. We must always, always be moving out and moving forward with God's plan. When the persecution broke out, it says in the church of Jerusalem, all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Verse 4, and those that had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. A problem came. Now, God had told them already, I want you to go out and make disciples of all nations. Start in Jerusalem. Then what do he say? Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's the goal in the ministry of the church. Amen? Amen? To go and make disciples. We've got it reversed. It's called the great reversal. We don't go and tell. We come and sit and put out a sign that says, come. And by the way, here's the time you can come. Don't come between there because we might not be there. <laughs> come at this time. That's not the New Testament model, is it? Yes, we have times we do come and we worship and we encourage and we exalt the Lord and we're ministered to and we minister to each other. But then we go. And wherever we go, we exude verse 4 of that chapter. It says we go teaching, we go preaching, we go telling, we go making a difference. Hey, folks, you've got the answer, by the way. Why are you letting anybody intimidate you? You've got everything the world needs. You've got what the world's looking for. Yes, they're blind and sometimes literally stupid, amen? They just don't realize it. But they'll never realize it if we don't ever tell them. They'll never understand if we don't explain. And we are that organism in this world, not of this world, in this world, to go into the world and make the difference. Salt, light. Isn't it amazing all those parables about salt and light and keys and yeast and all that stuff? All those things are things that penetrate. Light penetrates the darkness. Salt penetrates what you put it on like meat. It'll penetrate it. The key penetrates the door, amen? The yeast penetrates what it's been put in like the bread or the dough. Our lives have been thrust out, are to be thrust out, so that we are making the difference wherever we go in whatever format we're going in. But when we go, we know that we're going with a purpose. That it's not just a pastor's job or an evangelist's job or a missionary's job. It's our responsibility as the church, the bride of Christ, the people of God, to be the ones who go out and penetrate this culture and this society and make the difference that God's called us to do. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you where the problem arises. We'll close with this. The problem arises, the longer you know Jesus, the fewer lost people without Christ you know. Am I right? The longer you're saved, your whole friendship status changes. All right? It just changes. The more people, the longer you're saved, and you're really committed to Christ, you, you are surrounded by more and more and more people of like mind, like heart, and like faith. So here's what has to happen if we're going to be obedient to God. That's a natural flow. There's nothing that we ought to have lots of believer friends. Amen? So we have to become intentional. I mean, literally, you have to make our mind up. This is something I am going to do. One, because I love God. And two, because God told me to do it. And because I love him, I obey. So I have to become intentional about wherever I am to realize that there I am for a reason, that there I am as salt, there I am as salt. Whether I'm at the grocery store, whether, I, whether I'm at the, at the gasoline station or, or at the donut stand, that I, that I am there and God's got me there as an ambassador, as a representative of the kingdom of God. So I must become dis disciplined. I must become committed to who I really am. And say, if this is what God's called me to, I'm never going to be satisfied until I discover it. So I'm going to have to become, for lack of a better term, just intentional. I am intending and planning and committing, and I will do this. Because, hey, if I don't, it's that natural effect of just being surrounded by more and more people that love Jesus and less and less of the people that don't love Jesus. The, reason, the very reason we participated even in what we call National Back to Church Sunday along with 15,000 other churches across this nation was so that we could be intentional about inviting people and encouraging people to come to church and reminding them of the importance of church and that we are part of a, a real community of, of faith. That we're part of an authentic group of people who really are serious about what God says in the scripture and that we have some eternal priorities and we're investing in things that matter in life and we want our life to mean something and we are, care, we are people who care about what happens in our culture, in our community, in our schools and in our neighborhoods. We want to make a difference in the world around us. But again, we have to be seriously committed to do what God's called us to do. And I wonder how many of you are really serious about saying, hey, God help me to develop some relationships with people that don't know you and to be interested in people that don't know you. In fact, to be interested in the people that, Lord, I normally wouldn't even talk to just because of the way they look. 
This is what God wants from our church, I believe. And if you're here today and you haven't been a part of a church and you're a believer and you've somehow let that wane in your life and had not been really committed, if you're here today not a part of this fellowship, this is what we're doing. We are not the perfect church. We shared that in a video earlier. But we are endeavoring and seeking to follow the model that the Scripture has given us and that's been laid out clearly before us in the Bible. And we invite you to join in on this journey with us to be what God's called us to be in this community. If you are here and you don't know Christ, you're missing out on the most important thing that God ever planned for your life, and that is a relationship with Him. You were born to be born again. You were born to know God. You were born to have a relationship with God. You were not born to live isolated and despair and defeated and hopeless without any direction in life. That's not what God's plan for your life is. He said, I've come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. But you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to make your mind up. You're going to have to quit looking at people and looking at excuses and things and say, listen, God, you're the one I'm going to look to. And you are infallible and you're perfect and your love is perfect and I am not I am fallible and my love is not perfect, so I come to you and ask you to forgive me and make me this new person that only you can make me. Make me a new man. I finally got desperate in my life to come to that place and say, Lord, I am not what I want to be. And I've sought down a lot of different dead-end roads to get there, and it's not there. If what you say in this Bible is true, that's what I want. That's what I want. I gave my heart and life to Christ. And I have never been disappointed by God. I've been disappointed by myself. I've been disappointed by some of God's people. But I've never been disappointed by God. Amen. 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 So maybe you've been hurt in some other situation. Get back to the Father. Get back to Jesus. Realize that His purposes for your life are higher and better and nobler. And life fulfilling is in Christ Jesus. If you're here today without Christ, I encourage you to give your heart and your life to Him. If you're here today without a church, I encourage you as a Christian to come. Be a part of what God's doing here. But whatever the Lord is saying to you, don't let this moment pass. This is, not a, this is not a little bump in the road for you. This is where God had you today. And I do believe that we can maximize the sovereignty of God. And then in the sovereignty of God, God had you here to hear this message. That you would respond to it. And you would let God do something unique and very special in your heart and life that only He can do. Would you stand with your heads bowed today?